What's up, guys? Today on Ether. <laughs> What's up, guys? Frank Macalusa from Gar. Why is it moving? <laughs> So today we're gonna to be finishing up some things with the wiring. We got a coolant leak we gotta figure out. We gotta get these headlights in. We gotta get the turn signals working. The body electrical side of things, we gotta get all that working and iron out any kinks. So stand by, hang out with me, and we'll see how we can get, get going on this thing, huh? Now let's get the headlights installed. Uh, really nothing much to it, just install them and hook them up and uh, hook up power to the car and just make sure that most of the stuff within the car works. And if it doesn't, we'll just take it day by day or minute by minute. So I hooked up power to the car and I got the headlights installed. Um, I think the problem is a grounding issue. I think I might have forgot something in the harness. So um, actually I know I did. I just want to walk you guys through it. Um, this is the ground for basically all of these functions. So without the ground, you don't have that complete circuit that finishes um, and gets the headlights on. So turn signals on, fog lights, whatever, um, it doesn't turn off. So <clears throat> we need to install the grounding here and hopefully it'll turn right on. Let's take a look. Well, let me show you why the turn signal doesn't work on the right side. For those of you who are new to this stuff, when, uh, when one of the turn signals goes out, it blinks twice as fast, so you know that there's something wrong with the car, and you can hear it. I have the turn signal on the right side, and it's not going, it's blinking twice as fast. Why is that? There is a harness issue here. You can see right there, looks like it was tampered with in the past. For some reason, it didn't take much pressure to remove that uh, splice, and you can see clearly that there's some uh, exposed wiring right there. So we just got to wire this back up, and hopefully this uh, this should run just fine because we do not have any problem with our bulb. Our filaments are perfect. You can see them. Remember what I was telling you about the, the light being different, uh, different intensities, one for the marker and one for the turn. If I were to uh, put this guy on, you can see the intensity of that, compare it to the intensity of this. Oh, yeah, so compare it, compare it this to this with the other wire. See a lot, a lot brighter? That is your turn signal wire. So, as a result, this guy, which I already have the marker light on because it was on the other one, is going to be the right wire. Um, so I need to crimp this. All right, so from the test driving here, we realized we did get a coolant leak. Looks like this hard line uh, ended up snapping on this. Uh, you can see how the, the, the tab there broke and uh, it did open up the line. The sway bar was too close to it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna end up cutting this guy off and we're gonna put a, a soft a hose on there and we're gonna track it a little bit differently so it avoids the sway bar in the future. You can see here how it's leaked and it leaked all over my garage floor, which is a travesty, but we will figure it out. We'll get this thing going. We'll fill it back up, pressurize the system, and uh, and uh, that's uh, one more thing that we fixed and avoided. So 
What we're gonna do is we're gonna use these hose clamps. It's really good for anything one to one and a half inch two, uh, hose size. We're gonna clamp it on one end here. And we're gonna clamp this guy on the other end right here. Right there. That isolates this hard line that has a broken tab. And we're gonna cut this hard line. We're gonna put a hose from here over to here. And we're going to avoid this sway bar uh, to prevent it from hitting the hose uh, on hard turns when the sway bar flexes at its max. We added a hose here, um, finishing this up. We put a, a zip tie on it for now. We're gonna end up using a, a more formal P-clamp for holding that down. Uh, but yeah, this is gonna definitely, uh, as you can see here, it's gonna, it's gonna shield it from the sway bar really well. So we fix this. Uh, so let's move on to the next. So now it's time to replace that DME, which appears to be in limp mode, and remove the, the cast unit, remove all that stuff, and, uh, and get the good castle DME in there. Uh, we think that this engine's in limp mode. I'll show you how. Let's start it up really quick. Let's start it up. Ready? All right, it, it starts and idles just fine. But when Ben gives a little throttle, you can see. Those are pretty, that's full, full throttle. Takes a while to get to climb. So yeah, I mean, he's got experience driving his E92 every day, so he knows how this thing feels. And basically, he doesn't even want to drive it yet because he knows that it's just going to be underpowered. As I was explaining it to him earlier for my test drive, it just wasn't there. So we think that this is in limp mode, and let's just get this, this DME out of here. Let's replace it with the Castle unit, and let's get this thing running. So this is the Castle, uh, the Castle Performance DME uh, for the N54. It's called an MSD 81. Ben, you mind opening that up for me? There's a knife right there on the left. Or actually, is it a zip bag? Yeah, it is. Ooh. So Castle, what they do is they, they basically uh, wrap this up in what's called an ESD sensitive bag, so it prevents any type of electrostatic discharge from affecting the, the operation of the unit. So um, it's a good safety measure for any uh, sensitive electronics. This is an MSD81. This is a stock tune with EWS removed. The VIN number has been flashed onto this, so that VIN from the E36 is now on this DME, so when you plug it into OBD2 for, for inspection purposes, it will recognize it as that car. So pretty nifty how they did that. Um, this is uh, completely stocked, there's no tune on it yet. We'll end up putting this on as is, it'll be a stock, stock tune, and um, Castle will end up uh, tunneling into my computer while I'll have my uh, FTDI cable here. And this cable will end up getting hooked up into the OBD2 port, and he'll be able to uh, lay over the tunes that we uh, that we had talked about putting on. So what we want to do first is we want to get this completely running, not in limp mode, and observe what the codes are and address them with Castle. If there's any issues that we find, we're going to end up tweaking and figuring out how to how to get it uh, exactly perfect, uh, so that uh, when Castle does productionize this, you know that that you're getting a good product every time. So we're kind of like an early adopter to this technology. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to put the DME in first and then we're going to uh, just see what happens. An exciting time lapse that was, huh? So now we got the Castle DME, it's the MSD81. It is now in. Um, everything is exactly the same. Now I got to hook up the battery. What I'm expecting to happen is I'm expecting that I'm going to be able to start this car without pressing the start button, which means I could probably just remove the cast at that point. All right, so we got it hooked up, battery's on. Um, I just got to get my uh, uh, wake up wire connected. Doesn't matter what you do. I don't know what want that Let's see. So we got to get this guy hooked up to this guy. So far, everything is behaving exactly like the stock DME. I did not press the start button, and now I'm expecting that it'll just start right up. Let me press the start button. It's 
So that was a little disconcerting, but we'll figure it out. So we talked to Jim, we got OBD2 hooked up. It is connected. I do need to update a new version of Impa on my computer so I can talk to it. However, talking with, uh, with Castle Performance, we have determined that the way that the software is programmed right now in the DME is that it still is relying on a signal from the CAS unit in order to, to turn um, certain functions on to get the car started. In particular, there's this white wire, it's called a, PA, a bus PA signal. This is a direct connection from the CAS unit to the DME. So when that is connected, it works. When you disconnect it, um, you cannot start the car. So we need to figure out and, and work with Jim to get those um, drivetrain trouble codes from the DME because it wasn't starting and seeing which one of those codes is causing this default and um, and go from there. I uh, Hold on, don't do that yet. Go down to the, the tunnel. I have uh, on the bottom that, that three arrow icon there. That's how I go into Infa. That's how I use it. I use Windows XP. Man, you really know what you're doing. I can tell you. Uh, no, I guess I've done enough of them that I like, can kind of start seeing the same. All right, so last night we were up until maybe about 2, 2.30 in the morning. Uh, Jim at uh, Castle Performance and I were trying to figure out uh, how to get um, the DME flashed and, and what is causing the communication issue between CAS and the DME that still won't allow it to start without, without the CAS being in the line. So he's got a couple of, uh, uh, of, tr of things he wants to try um, with the PA bus line but um, just couldn't uh, couldn't get into my DME. I don't know if there was something wrong with uh, my cable or my program, but this didn't work. So good news is that I got the BMW Standard Tools 2.12 uploaded and running on my uh, Windows 10 PC 64-bit. So now I can look at all the MSD81 codes just like I could do with the uh, E46 and my E53, uh, which is really cool. Um, before my old Impa, uh, and my old Win KFP would not work. So um, now it works, and it works. It's faster. It's better. So um, I feel I feel like we made a little bit of progress yesterday, and uh, hopefully we can really get to the bottom of this uh, not too long from now, and uh, and figure out how to get this thing running without CAS, and figure out what's going on with the limp mode. We think that they are related, and uh, and then uh, we're going to be in a really good spot to zoom through with this. So um, more more progress later. Oh,